Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, yesterday we moved all of our debug control code over into using our sort of new debug interface stuff. Uh, but we didn't get a chance to actually turn any of that on. We just kind of did all the work of like planning it out and making it into macros and putting it into the debug stream and all that stuff. Uh, but we don't actually have any way of uh, actually testing it yet. So what we're going to do here is wire that up. Uh, and this will kind of be nice too because now we don't have to go through a compile cycle to switch uh, debug switches on and off anymore. They can just be switched in real time. Uh, which is going to be nice because we just found when we tested it, going through a compile cycle for that, even though it was only a few seconds, is just a little too long. You kind of want it to be uh, roughly instantaneous, you know, roughly one frame uh, of lag instead of, you know, uh, 120 frames of lag or however many it is when MSVC gets involved. So that's what we'll be doing today. Today is day 214, so if you uh, are following along at home with the source code because you're one of those... Uh, folks who ordered it on, uh, who pre-ordered the game, uh, you want to unpack day 213 source code because that's what I'm starting with today. Uh, so go ahead and do that and you will be right where I am right now. All right. So uh, where we left things uh, was we were compiling properly, uh, where we had all of our debug switches actually compiling out and doing the things that they needed to do. Uh, but we want to now start to have them show up in here. And uh, in order to do that, obviously, we're going to have to have some way uh, of having them, uh, you know, actually wired into the system, right? Uh, so what we do know so far is if you take a look at handmade debug.h, what we do know is we've done the work, and I'll also load up instructions, to in, um, sorry, interface.h. Uh, what we do know is that when these things, if we turn off the, the sort of nullification of them, because we did it right here, uh, where we sort of had a way of turning them off like this, uh, which, you know, eventually is something that would only happen here. In fact, we can go ahead and move that down here now. Uh, this is the thing that kind of turns them off. So if they are turned on, what we know is that they are going to call a thing called initialize debug value. And really, our job at this point is to go ahead and uh, figure out how we're gonna get things that call, uh, oops, this actually probably should be like that, okay. Uh, things that call that initialize debug value thing, we need to get those working so that they show up in the hierarchy. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, we looks like we have a situation here where we didn't quite uh, fix this one. Uh, debug if just uses a path now so we can do it like that, it looks like. Is that correct? Uh, or is that actually uh, wrong and antiquated? I, th I think that's right. That's, that's fine. Uh, all right. So uh, yeah, what we need to do now uh, is we need to figure out some way. It looks like there's a, a bug in this thing here now, which is for some reason uh, when it's doing the concatenation, when it's doing the pasting, it's still getting debug variable variable. What's the, ah, I see. It's because this is supposed to be path. We didn't update that one. Uh, so what we need to do is actually get these guys working and um, figure out some way uh, to make sure that they kind of get exposed in our debug hierarchy. Now it looks like we also have debug variable at the finish, uh, that one as well. So looking at debug variable, it looks like path is getting used somewhere, perhaps uh, where path is not supposed to be used. Uh, yep, that needs to be stringized and it wasn't stringized. Uh, but now I think we're good. And so now we're just at the point where initialize debug value is gonna have to actually get fielded by our debug code, right? Uh, we've got everything compiling and doing its thing, but we need somewhere where this is actually gonna sort of hook in uh, to the debug system, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and make that happen. Uh, I feel like it should probably actually have had as well, um, you know, since this is kind of an, an entry point, I feel like this should actually be debug initialize value or something like that, um, something like this where it's actually got the debug prefix in front of it, just so it's clear what's going on there. Maybe something uh, like this, like that. Okay. Uh, and with something like that, uh, now we know that any time we see one of these debug values in the code, it's gonna come in like this. And really what we need to do now is we need to figure out a way of, of again, hooking that into our system. Hooking that into the system is not going to be particularly difficult uh, at the moment, I don't think. 
uh, because all we really need to do is create one of our little debug hierarchies and it can be basically a static hierarchy, right? Because it's not something that changes every frame. It's something that's consistent across the entire program for the most part. The only thing that we have to worry about is whenever the program gets reloaded, right? Those static values are gonna vaporize, right? Those static values are gonna go away. So if we, if we want our system to work with our dynamic code loading, we have to be a little bit more careful uh, with how that's gonna work exactly. But other than that, uh, we should be fine, right? Other than that, we should be fine. Now, there's ways we could make it work where we don't have to worry about that as much. Um, but I think we wanna do it the way that we're doing it so far for a number of reasons. We'll see as we kind of go in there. Uh, but basically what that means is when we do debug initialize value, uh, you can see here that this gets passed. It's sort of the, the, the static value uh, that it's actually talking about, right? And sort of what I'm talking about here is when the, the debug system reloads, does a reload, uh, that is gonna invalidate all of these pointers, right? Because if you see what happens here, the, the way that I've set it up uh, is whenever you declare one of these debug variables, uh, like an if or a regular one, it creates a debug variable that's local to the stack of that function, but persistent. So it's like a global variable, but that's only local to the scope of that function. So other people can't reference it, obviously. Um, it creates that value. And then that value uh, is something that's going to be uh, uh, twiddled with by the debug system. I mean, the debug system has to re reach in there and change what the value actually is uh, for people to do stuff like toggle the debug switches on and off. So in order to do that, what I did is I passed the address of that persistent value so that basically anyone in the debug system now knows they can reach in and poke that value and change it to something else. The problem with that is as soon as the debug executable gets reloaded, all of that data is now gone, right? Those pointers are no longer valid. And so what we would wanna make sure that we did if we were trying to support uh, the dynamic code reloading is we wanna have a way of making, sh uh, like making note effectively uh, of the fact that those debug values uh, have gone away, right? So we could flush them or something. Now for bonus points, we might wanna try and make it so that any values that we had set get carried over to the new version. Um, and I think there's ways we could probably do that as well. Uh, and so we can kind of think a little bit about that uh, as we go. Uh, I'm I kind of sort of homebrewing an idea for that. Uh, it, it's just like percolating in my head. Uh, but basically what I'm thinking is if we wanted to do something like dynamic code reloading what, and, and in addition, if we want these values to be persistent across runs, which I think we do, then I think what we want to do is keep the concept of our config.h here with these global constants. And what I was thinking is when we do these debug value initialize things, what we could do is when the debug value gets initialized, we could pass in right what that initial value was going to be. Uh, so that when the initial value, get, so, so that when you relaunch the program, it knows what the value was supposed to be because we could always rewrite this file with the most recent values that the person has set in the debug user interface. That's just what I'm thinking. Uh, and so basically this thing down here, which creates this, this sort of global constants thing, like so, uh, what I'm imagining there is it would sort of say, oh uh, yeah, when you create this initial value, this debug initialize value, uh, there's gonna be ways of passing something into that. Uh, so when you do this, you get the, those constants, those constants come out, right? Like so. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted. Not what I wanted. In fact, what is happening? Get rid of that. No, bad, bad. Okay, uh, let's try that one more time. Let's try that one more time, right? Like that. Uh, okay. So what I want to do here, right, is I want to give it a way of getting what the value should have been that can persist across runs. Uh, so I'm letting that happen through that config thing. Uh, and so in order to do that, what I mean is what I need to do here is make sure that this thing uh, has a couple different types of value potentially, right? Some way of making sure that this thing uh, can, can actually initialize itself in a meaningful way. And so this is mostly the kind of values that we're using, right? Um, you could imagine maybe these, be the, these would be sort of the value types that were happening there. And so probably what I would wanna do is I would wanna make it uh, so that this guy uh, has a bunch of variants, right? Uh, and each one of them 
is basically just all it's doing is it's doing a, a, a type it, it cracks out the type there uh, that's really all it's meant to do uh, and again it's just kind of an annoying c++ -y thing you could use a template for it perhaps if you wanted to uh, well no you couldn't actually use a template for it uh, not in this particular case but point being you could use a better language for it Anyway, uh, so what we need to do is make sure that we have these specified such that all of the things we might want to pass are there. I'm not sure what the best way necessarily to do that would be. Maybe, would this be enough to keep it satisfied? I'm not sure. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Uh, so as long as we have all of these, and that's probably actually an S32 there. Uh, that's how that is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So one of the problems is, you know, with something like a bool, we don't really have much of a way of stating specifically that it is a bool or not. Uh, and so that might be something that we have to say specifically. Uh, we may have to say debug initialize value like bool, right, or something like that, uh, where we've got the S32s in there, but we also have one of these that's actually specific to bool, uh, and it's like debug initialize uh, bool or b32, something like that, right? Uh, and that one we would use with the ifs. And the reason that I was saying that we have to do that is because it's not going to be able to know the difference between an integer uh, and a regular. Uh, it's not going to be able to know the difference because we just use our Boolean type is the same as our integer type, right? We don't have two different types. So it needs kind of like one additional one here uh, that's going to be able to do that bool thing. Do that bool thing, right? So we need one more there. Uh, but anyway, that's what we're talking about here. And what we want to do is we want to turn all these into something uh, reasonable, right? We want to turn all these into something that just kind of do, does whatever it needs to do. So it's like it calls debug initialize value uh, with sort of the, the base set of things that has to happen, right? Without the value that's being set. Uh, and then once it knows that it's it's okay to go, uh, you know, this is always going to just return that that whatever the event is that's actually being pointed to here. Uh, but once it, it's done with that, it's just going to know that it can set the value uh, to whatever the value was passed in. And that's just a way of like, again, getting that initialization to happen automatically uh, for the calling code. And so this is again, what this is doing, you know, with these, the way that this code is being structured, again, it's designed to remove as much work as possible from the other side of the calling fence, right? Uh, it's designed as much as possible to sort of, uh, to fix that part of the problem. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's really all that's happening there. In fact, you know what I realized too? You know, it's too bad, now that I think about it, when we do the debug initialize value thing, it's too bad. I wonder if we could use a comma here. I wonder, I wonder if we could use a comma here to get out of this business all entirely. Let's see, Can we? do you guys wanna take a look at that? I want to, I'm into it. I don't know if you're into it, but I'm into it. Um, I'm just saying, hypothetically speaking, uh, suppose we were to do something uh, that's not going to actually compile or anything like that. Suppose we were to get rid of all this stuff and we just said, no, 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 no. Instead, what we're going to do is when we do de debug initialize value and we've got that type in there, we're going to call that and just let that initialize the event, but we're going to use the sequence operator. I mean, I said it, we're going to use the sequence operator to sneak in and do another operation inside the equals, right? I don't know, it's a bold move. Is it, is it brassy? Is it ballsy? Yes. Um, am I gonna go for it? Yes. I think that's just the way you gotta be sometimes. You gotta program, you gotta program dirty sometimes, you know what I mean? You gotta just get up in there and you gotta do it. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna do here. So if I were to take this event, I know that I can construct if I have that the, the type, right? Which in this case I know is a, is a bool32, right? I know I could do it this way, and in here I'll know the type as well because the type's passed in there. So I'm just wondering uh, if I can use the sequence operator to steal away a little bit of an assignment here, right? And I don't know, right? I don't know if I can do that. Maybe I can, uh, maybe I can't, uh, but we'll find out. Uh, and oops, the event that we're in question is actually that, right? Will it work? I don't know. Nobody knows, nobody can ever know. How could they? Uh, initializing connect, connect from B32 to debug event. Uh, yep, put them in the wrong order. That's a little bit of a risk with the sequence operator. Uh, let's find out if we're okay here. Still not good, missing before period. Which period? Debug value path. 
Uh, that's not right. Why did I do that? We want, no, that is right. Debug value path. Why did that not work? Debug value path dot. It's missing a closing quote. Hmm. But why is it missing a closing quote? Don't really understand. I don't need those parentheses anymore. Don't really understand. Missing semicolon before period. It doesn't seem to like this construction very much, uh, or at least if I'm not mistaken, it does not seem to like that very much. But of course I might be mistaken. So why does it think I'm missing the semicolon in there? What exactly, <clears throat> Jimmy, what exactly are you complaining about? Because I know debug value pound pound path is a valid value to look at. And I feel like I should be able to access off of it. I wonder if it's just a case of, you know, is it just my sequence operator uh, nonsense that I'm trying to pull, which admittedly is a little bit janky. Uh, is that your problem? Uh, type care unexpected. Yeah, that does look a little bit like, I guess it does not like my sequence operator there. I feel like that should, it's probably because it's in the initializer that it doesn't like that would be my guess. Um, so maybe what I can do, and again, this is me just, I'm, like I said, I'm really kind of doing some ridiculous things here. You know, don't try this at home. But what I could do here is say, oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, maybe I use the sequence operator inside the expression. So I do something where I try to put it in, well, I can't put it in a parameter list. Meh, meh. Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm just trying to figure out if there's any way I could get it in there in some way that makes it so that we don't have to deal uh, with, uh, with the rest of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so let's try it this way. Uh, this is, again, completely ridiculous what I'm doing, uh, but I'm just going to try it. Uh, does not take for, uh, wow, so that worked, apparently. Okay, so I don't know if you saw what I tried to do here. Again, this is kind of ridiculous, but basically what I wanted to do is I'm initializing a static. I don't want anything to escape that static initialization because I only want it to happen once, right? I don't want it to happen every time through this code. I only want it to happen once. So it needs to be on the right side of the expression that initializes the static. So I have a function call here. <clears throat> And what I wanted to do uh, was I wanted to somehow figure out a way uh, to get this particular piece of code to execute in there. So what I did is I used the sequence operator, right, the comma, to say, hey man, do this first, then do this second uh, to produce this first argument. And it was okay with that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pretend that that was okay. I'm gonna pretend nothing weird happened, even though something very weird just happened. And I'm gonna do it again. I'm just gonna straight up do it a second time because that's the way we roll here. Uh, so here it is a second time. <clears throat> and here's the reason I was trying to do it here is because now we only need one copy of debug initialized value because what we can do is do the assignment uh, right in here. So here's the value that we wanna set. We just set value and then we paste on uh, the type and we say equals. And now we've generated all of those versions that I was manually copying out before. Those are done now. <clears throat> so that's awesome. That saves a lot of typing. Lot of typing. So now we have all of our types handled and we didn't have to duplicate functions at all. That's pretty fun. Sequence operator occasionally comes in. Very, very handy. Very, very handy. Love your sequence operator. For those of you who don't know what it does, it just allows you to put in multiple expressions and then it just uses the value of what is it, the last expression? Yeah, it just takes the value of whatever the last expression was. So you can just chain a bunch of unrelated expressions together and it just executes the last one, right? Well, it executes all of them, but it evaluates to the value of the last one. All right, uh, so we'll see if that worked. That, again, like I said, kind of ridiculous uh, maneuver there, but sometimes they're warranted. 
Uh, let's go ahead and make debug initialize value work in some way that makes some sense to somebody sometime somewhere. Uh, inside handmade uh, interface, debug interface, we should have that definition for the debug event. Uh, there it is. <clears throat> right? Uh, and so I'm assuming that well, the way we would want to do this uh, is the clock value would be zero. Uh, the file name uh, would be whatever the file name is. Uh, the uh, line number, the block name is the name you pass in. Uh, the line number uh, would be whatever the line number actually is. So we could maybe pass those in now. We could we could easily pass those in if we wanted to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we've got the thread ID. Uh, I'm not sure how much we care about the thread ID necessarily, uh, but we could even do that if we wanted to. That isn't don't we just have a way to do get thread ID? Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how we do get core index. Um, I feel like the core index is not relevant. I want to say the thread ID isn't relevant either. I don't know. I'm going to leave those initialized zero, zero now because this is kind of a permanent standing variable. So I don't know what it even means to say some of those things about it. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so if we've got that set up, uh, really all we would need to do here is pass in the file name and the line number, you know. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and make it so that that uh, is what these guys expect to see here. Here we are in the interface code uh, debug initialize value. Uh, if I want to here, I can demand those two things and then these guys will just go ahead and give them to me, right? Like so. And there we go. So now we've initialized these events. So the only thing that we need to do now, the only thing we need to do in addition to that is figure out some way uh, to add like something into our debug system that would allow us to manipulate these types indirectly, right? Or, you know, that would, that would allow them to sort of do like a pointer to this event, right? And so in order to do that, we need to, to add something that points into these events uh, and we, you know, we have a way of doing that, right? That's, that's, uh, that's what our sort of system is set up to do. Uh, there's like sort of the add to group thing, right? We've got add, uh, add um, uh, how does this work here? We, we did this inside our, our sort of gathering thing. Uh, and data block, open data block, open data block. There we go. Uh, so this stuff essentially here, uh, when we do open data block and uh, close data block, really what we want to do here is we want to do this, this part where we add events to a data block. What we really want to do is just that, right? What we want to do is take these things when we get them, we want to add them just like we were adding other stuff. Uh, and then we just need some group to add them to. Uh, so if we get the debug state, right? Uh, in here and I'm gonna go ahead and we need there's one other thing that we're gonna need to do because this asserts gonna fire and it's something that I mentioned we should probably do uh, the other day but uh, we didn't do so we're gonna have to do it now uh, what we want to do here is just say okay uh, I've got this debug state what I'd like to do is I'd like to add a variable to this group you know I'd like to, to push it on there we do have one sort of nasty thing here which is that we don't necessarily know that these calls are coming from the same thread right so we would need some way of making sure that when we do the, when we add things to this group we would like to be able to make sure that only one thread is doing that addition at a time right so in order to do that we need some kind of a mutex here right we need to take some kind of a, of a lock to just go i need to you know i need to access this data member which is this group structure here i don't have lock free versions of that code, right? It, it's all just assuming that it can just write the pointers and that they'll be coherent at the time. Uh, and so what we need to do here is like something that would basically take this lock, right? We need something that would go like, okay, you know, um, you know, we need like an acquire mutex, you know, release mutex thing that just allows uh, us to modify that data member um, as we go. And this is the only place that this really has to happen because most of the time uh, it's just not an issue. There are two ways we could do this. We could also instead push, and you know what I just realized? It's probably smarter if we actually do the push. 
it's probably smarter to just let these be collated sometime after the fact. I mean, if when you get right down to it, that's probably the case. We wouldn't need to take a mutex or anything like that. We could, what we could do is just add a, an event in here that's like, hey, I want to record this permanent variable. So actually, that's probably much more likely what we should do. That would also get us out of the business of having to uh, initialize the debug system, which I said we were going to have to do. We wouldn't have to do that. Um, so yeah, never mind. That probably is a better way to do this, and we should do that better way. Now. Okay, uh, so yeah, if we want to do that, off we go. Uh, what that's going to look like is, is uh, well, this stuff here uh, can pretty much stay the way that it is. Really, all that's going to look like is inside handmade uh, debug interface. All we would do is say, well, okay, when we do, you know, um, when we do all this stuff here, uh, and we're sort of uh, doing these, like creating these persistent variables, and we do the debug initialize value, what the debug initialize value actually would be at that point, right? is the debug initialize value would, would actually have to be uh, or include some, uh, some code to push something onto the debug stream, right? So it would wanna be one of these things here that does a record debug event and record debug event um, would just push the fact uh, that this initialization had occurred, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, so pretty much uh, I think that's mostly all we need to do. So let's look at how record debug event works in general. It looks like it works just, yeah, exactly what you would think, right? So, yeah, I wanna do that operation. I'm just not sure uh, if, I guess probably what we would need to do is kind of two, two stage that, right? So we'd wanna do it something like this, probably. Um, and this would be uh, not a string. So what we'd want to do is like we've got debug initialize value here, uh, and then it calls into you know sort of the the um, the one level down version of that. Uh, so yeah, it would be more like this. Here is our initial call. It's just an inline function, and the inline function does a record debug event uh, to do that uh, this thing. And it, it, this is basically something that's like uh, mark you know. Uh, mark debug value or something. And that mark debug value would tell where it is. Then it would, after it recorded the debug event, which is thread safe and all that, then it would call in and do this stuff. Although I guess now that I think about it, that stuff can just go right here as well. So, you know, yeah. I guess this goes away entirely. So I guess this just becomes an inline, like so. Uh, and this is not existing. This itself will just do what it needs to do. Record debug event presumably returns the event, I'm guessing. Um, and so the event, uh, there's actually two events. This is the like mark, mark event. That mark event uh, just has to have an event pointer that points to our event. And then it's marked, right? Makes some sense. Okay, so all that has to happen for that to work as far as I can think of in my head. And again, so that makes that totally thread safe as well, which is kind of nice. Uh, is that in here we need some way of marking these things. So we need something that's like debug type, you know, mark event, um, or mark debug value rather. And then in here we need something that's like a debug event star event. Uh, and that I think would be it, right? Uh, although this should be called value debug event to maintain consistency. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, illegal use of this type is an expression, U64. What are you talking about? What are you saying? Oh, right, it works like this. Um, so I guess in this case, and that will probably define event for us because this is a macro that expands to something. So I guess technically what I would wanna do here is debug event, this is actually like the sub event or something, right? Uh, so it would be something that looks like this. Uh, and this is value debug event. So that's it, I think.
Seems good. Yeah. All right. So I think that does everything we needed to do. These are now in the debug stream. They can be picked up by uh, people who are trying to collate them. Uh, and then they can be added. So I don't know, again, like I said, uh, whether that's the best thing or not, but I just kind of thought of it. And it seems like it solves all the problems that we might have had with them, which is like, yeah, you know, we would have had to make sure that it was thread safe and we would have had to make sure the debug system was initialized at the time. Now we don't care about any of that. These values just go into the stream like everything else. And then later on the debug system, if it cares, we'll pick them up. If it doesn't care, it just won't, right? And so in here, we'd have something like case debug type, you know, uh, mark debug event or whatever debug value. And in here, we would just do a collate add variable to group. And when we add the variable to the group, uh, we would be adding that sub event uh, to some group. Now, there's a little bit more to it than this. It's a little bit more complicated uh, to create the hierarchy. Uh, so that's the code we'll write for the next 20, 30 minutes or whatever. I guess we have 30 minutes left. Uh, for the remainder of the show, we'll write that code. But at first, let's just get it working uh, where all the variables kind of just show up in a list that aren't hierarchical. Uh, and then we'll from there kind of go into something that does a little uh, bit more fancy, pantsy, dancy, nancy stuff uh, to it, right? So there's collate, add variable to group. We have the debug state. Uh, we have the event on, on this end. In the middle uh, is the problem because these two things actually are just fine because if we want to add it, we know it's the sub event. So it's just event value debug event. That's the one that we're trying to add. We've already marked it. It's good. The problem is we don't know what group to add it to here. We have no idea. So what we want to do here uh, is we want to do something uh, like, you know, get group uh, for a name or something like this. Uh, or, or uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't know. We're gonna, it's good, that's, that's what's get group for name. Everyone loves get group for name, don't you? I do, I think, I'm not sure. Point being, it's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, it's just how it goes sometimes. And then it would do call it out of a group. And, and you know, honestly, honestly, if we're being honest about it, I almost wanna say that if we were going to be super fancy about it if we were going to like double up on the fanciness now with extra fanciness i feel like we almost want to do this in a way that's a little slyer than that uh, that's going to be something more like this where we have debug events um or uh, uh i guess what does collate add variable to group return uh it add debug variable link okay so we'd have debug variable link and we do link and we do like get uh, hier uh, you know, hierarchical name or something, or get hierarchical link uh, from name, you know. And then in this thing, we would pass the event block name, and we'd say, like, I want you to get me the link for this thing, right, whatever it is. And, uh, and when you get me that link back, uh, what I want to do is say, whatever the link used to be in there, Ooh, this is a tricky one. This is actually pretty tricky. I'll be honest with you, it's pretty tricky. So I'm gonna draw this out for you. I'm gonna tell you what I was trying to do, just so we're clear on it. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see. I, I, the thing that I wanted to do, I'm not sure if it's not as easy as I thought it was gonna be. Uh, it's just a subtlety of this of the way this code worked. Oh, never mind. Uh, so I forgot I already solved this problem in my head, and I even talked about the beginning of the show. Uh, I'll tell you what I was thinking, just so you can uh, be a part of the thought process. Uh, but what I was thinking is like, okay, I'm going to create this debug hierarchy, right? And it's going to be like foo, and then there's a bar in here, and then there's like a baz. And the baz is going to be some floating point value that's like 5.0, right? And we're running the game, that's all good. And then we go ahead and the executable reloads, right? So the executable goes away, which means that the event that this was pointing to now goes away and we lose the 3.0. So I was thinking before was I was like, oh, I need to be able to like get back this one and remember the 3.0 so I can set it again and blah, 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 blah. I forgot I just did all that work to make sure that the global constants th flow through. So what's actually gonna happen is when we change these values, they'll write out to the global constant store. That like file, you know, it'll write out to handmade config.h. These values are gonna be written out into there eventually. 
which means that I don't have to care about that because the new executable will become preloaded with the right values. So that's actually kind of handy. And so I don't have to worry about the thing I was going to do. So forget all of that nonsense that I just said because it's all completely irrelevant. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, so yeah, so get a uh, group for name is actually, uh, you know, something like that. Uh, we could just say that that's going to return us whatever the group is that should be added to back to the original thing I was saying. That should be totally sufficient. Uh, if we don't have to do the preserve preservation thing. And this uh, again means that the only thing we actually need to do is implement this particular function where it finds out uh, what the group is for a particular name, right? And here's that name. Now we probably need to pass the debug state for that, I'm guessing, because otherwise how's it going to do the search? Uh, and then the other thing we're going to need is we're going to need some group that these things go into. Like before we kind of had um, this situation where we were adding things uh, to, to a group as the blocks got opened and closed, right? Um, and now, so we're going to have another one here that's like, uh, these are like the values group or whatever, right? The debug values group. Uh, so that group, uh, where do we do our root group, right? We create one here. It uh, looks like for, that's for frames. We don't care about that one. Uh, so it's really in here, right, is, is what we want. Yeah. Uh, so we have a problem here where we have the collate stuff. Uh, we, again, have sort of a, a nasty little situation that we have. Uh, and this is just gets back to us. We really need to kind of go finish uh, sometime soon doing the collation stuff as more of a permanent thing because really we want all of these guys to be permanent and then we want to wipe them out presumably so as we kind of move through frames we want to wipe out uh, data that's no longer necessary or something like this right um so we'll push that for a second uh and not have to think about that at the moment but uh yeah what we would want to do here is when we do uh that collate add variable to group you can see here that that puts it on the collation arena and that's a problem for us, right? Uh, so we kind of need to unify those at some point soon before we get too, too much further out of hand uh, because these are values that we don't want to go away. They're sort of permanent standing values. And so we kind of have that dichotomy there. Now, again, the only reason we have that dichotomy is because we haven't gone and finished sort of how we're doing our frame by frame processing. So that means that's probably the next thing. Maybe that's what we should start on tomorrow. Either that or we kind of have a long break, so maybe we uh, uh, put that off until after we come back since it might take more than a day to finish. Uh, hard to say, though. Maybe you could do it in a day. Hard to say. Uh, but anyway, so in here when, when we do this, we would need a, a, a separate way of doing uh, add collate parallel group. Like we'd need something where you could say like permanent in here, right? Um, and in here where we do our prostruct, uh, we would have to say whether you were trying to keep it for a while or not, right? Uh, and again, this is really not, like I said, this is not good. We don't want to actually leave it this way. Uh, this is just like definitely a thing where we're like to do, move everything to permanent uh, because really we don't want to actually do that kind of flushing. Uh, that was never the goal. It's just kind of how we uh, left the system because we hadn't actually figured out how we were going to do frame by frame processing yet. Uh, and yeah, so that'll have to be another thing. Anyway. Uh, so in here, if it's permanent, you know, it would go on the debug arena. If it's not permanent, it wouldn't. Not very complicated, right? Very simple. Uh, but that would have to happen. And then when we do get group for hierarchical name, at the moment, what we can do is just say, because we just are trying to get it working here, uh, what we can do is say, forget that. We're not actually going to do any of that at all. Instead, what we're going to do is just say, like, okay, uh, we have the debug state, uh, uh, values group, and everything is going to go on to the values group. Right, everything is, you know, everything that we have is going to go on to the values group. Uh, so that is is easy because we don't do any work here. Variable group, like so. Um, and then the other thing that we would need to do again is when we do collate, uh, where's the thing that does the group? Collate, create variable group, right? So this one right here where we create a variable group. Uh, that as well would also need to take uh, that permanent thing, right? Uh, like so. Uh, really, you know what? I don't know why I wrote it that way either. Since we're just talking about this, it would just be permanent debug state collate arena or debug state 
debug ring. So I'm not sure why I didn't do it that way. Both times, again, probably because I was too busy thinking about the fact that we probably should do that. Uh, but yeah, it's hard sometimes on Handmade Hero because, you know, I have to parcel things out into like way ways that are more coherent to explain, which is not always exactly how they would do them. And most of the time I can keep it so that they're the same, but sometimes it's like, ah, I would really go fix this now and just take two hours to do it and it would be done. Uh, but I know that doesn't fit inside a boundary like for episodes and stuff and it makes it a little bit uh, tricky in my head. Uh, but anyway, so that's relatively straightforward and that's all done and so now we're fine and everything is good. So uh, that should be all we would need to do there. I don't know why uh, we didn't call that debug state. Uh, but now these guys have to say, okay, this is uh, not permanent. Uh, this guy is permanent. Uh, right, this guy is not, this guy is not, this guy is not. And function does not take one arguments, that's true. Uh, and function does not take three arguments, that's also true. So there we go. Uh, so that's everything, but I need to initialize, when we initialize the debug system, I want to create an initial group. Uh, to hold all of these these peoples. Uh, so when we call debug start in here, uh, and this stuff kind of gets initialized at the beginning, I want to make sure that we have uh, everything that we need in here. So what I want to do is is make sure that we can do like a, um, yeah, like, you know, whatever the thing is, values group equals like collate create variable group, right? And that's a pretty bad name for it now because we're not actually thinking of it as a collation anymore because again, it'll pre presumably those names will change again. Uh, but yeah. So there's our values group. Uh, so now when we run that, I don't know, uh, it should in theory pick up all those debug variables and all we have to do now is actually have somewhere to display them. Now what we can do to display them temporarily too, right, is we've got sort of our debug draw bay menu uh, so all we have to do here in our debug draw main menu is when we are looping over these things, we can just do a thing where we go like, okay, our hacky group instead of this now is going to actually be something else. So our hacky group uh, is just going to be debug state values group. And this would show us what's in that group so we can test it and see if our stuff that picks up these values is working at all, which I don't know if it is, right? Um, okay. So let's see what's going on here. So first of all, this is some weirdness here. So first of all, we're sort of working in the sense that, hey, look, it wired up properly, uh, but why are we getting the same one? Why are we getting, uh, you know, a bunch of calls that are the same debug value? Because uh, that local persist should have only initialized uh, one time. So what is that about? Uh, so we've got a bunch of debugging to do, uh, but otherwise we're, you know, we're pretty close, right? Uh, we're, we're pretty close to what we want because it actually did wire up properly and uh, and we can actually turn on the actual value in real time now instead of having to go through the compile DOS cycle. So all we really need to do is figure out what's going on there uh, with the multiple ads um, and then we can uh, proceed, right? Okay, so let's let me start at the beginning uh, where we have uh, mark debug value. We're calling collate add uh, variable to group. We get the group here and in theory that should be fine. Uh, and we're adding in the event that's pointed to the value debug event, which should have been uh, that one. And in fact, I guess now I think about it, we probably should be using that one's name as well when we do that. We, that won't matter because we're not actually doing anything with it yet, uh, but when we would go to do that, that would have been a problem, right? Uh, so now when we call collate add variable to group, uh, what we wanna do is take a look here inside the interface thing and make sure that that's uh, an actual, that, that all of this stuff works out properly. Uh, so we have our sub event here that we're looking at. We are pointing to that one properly and that is the one that we're trying to add. We initialize the sub event with uh, the name as we should. We initialize the line number, the thread ID, the core type looks right uh, as well. Um, so all that stuff looks pretty good. We got about 10 minutes left on the clock uh, in addition. So we have actually 15 minutes left, which is quite a bit of time. So hopefully we can debug this in that time. Um, so our debug ifs here, hopefully, 
uh, look like there would be working relatively well to me. Uh, like that all looks pretty good. And uh, yeah, I don't see, I don't really see what the problem is here. I don't understand why we would get multiple ones. And we shouldn't ever, because this is always doing, you know, an initialization only once, local persist is defined to be static, right? I mean, let me just make sure that we didn't mess that up, but presumably uh, we don't, and if it wasn't, we'd get a lot more of them. So uh, yeah, local persist static. So I feel like that should have worked. Obviously it doesn't. So I'm gonna just set a breakpoint in debug uh, initialize value so I can see what's happening there uh, and figure out what's going on. So here we are getting called with this in game update and render. Here's ground chunks recompute on exe change. So I just wanna take a look here and see what we actually got. Uh, so here's our event. Uh, and the event looks about right. It's got a block name of nothing, which is what we expect because we didn't, we that's exactly what we passed. Um, it's got a line number, a thread ID that it all makes sense. It's got the type that we expect, right, which is to mark the debug value. Uh, and it's got values in here that don't actually correspond to anything quite yet, right? Uh, so then we would assign it, and now it's assigned a debug value uh, right here. Now, of course, that debug value is completely meaningless, but that's because we haven't initialized it yet. As we initialize it coming through here, you can see uh, that it gets basically what we would expect it to get. Here's the name that we expect it to have. There's the line number, the thread ID, uh, the type. Mm, what type is that? Debug v32, so that's good. Uh, and then it returns whatever that is, right? Uh, so now we should, uh, if we look at the locals here, uh, where we don't have the locals, I probably turned them off because I very rarely use them, but now I want them. If we look at the locals here, we should have, yeah, some stuff, and we do. So here is that debug value ground chunks recompute on exe change, which is this one here. Uh, here you can see it, it is set properly, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, it, although, although, why is it set, why is its value set to one? Oh, because that is what the default value is in the config. So that's, again, actually also totally correct. So that's even working properly. Uh, so it's got all that, and then it can do its little thing. Uh, and so that's all good. Everything there looks uh, fine. And I'm not sure, yeah, what the problem was there. Okay, so... I think I know what's wrong. In fact, I definitely know what's wrong. Yes. Two things. Don't ask me why I thought of this just now, but sometimes the brain works that way. Thing number one is it's in the wrong place of, for our processing, right? This is inside the collation frame processing, which means that if we have not hit a frame marker yet, we will not record it. Uh, and that is not what we want at all, right? That's like a bad situation. What we want to do is record it regardless, right? So what we want to do is in here, we want to actually have a special case, which is like, we always want these uh, no matter what, uh, right? So in here where we do uh, the else processing, we would want to do a thing where we say else if uh, and just like we did this one, right? Uh, we would want to do, okay, uh, else if uh, this, t well, actually it's not even else if, it would actually be up here, right? It's so if event type, uh, equals mark debug value, oops, that's no good. No matter whether we have a frame open or not, we want to capture it, right? So that was bug number one, because basically they were all happening on the first frame and they all got thrown out, right? We didn't bother to process them. Uh, so that should solve the problem of them not showing up, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, wait a minute. Did it somehow get past us here? If it, ah, missing an else 
Copy pasta, as you guys say. Okay. Uh, so now we've got all of these guys, right? Uh, you can actually see them all here. And so now the, the next question is just, how come we have so many of them, right? Like how come there are multiple of these guys? Uh, and the answer to that, I believe, is because the statics uh, are probably not being used in a thread safe way. Meaning multiple threads could probably all enter that and start using them, I guess. I don't actually know what the rules are for that because normally that's not something that I spend a lot of time looking at. Statics I almost never use. So the, in a debug system, the only time I would ever use them. And so I believe that this is actually something to do with that. Now you can see that it actually works just fine. It's just a question of why we've got so many of them, right? Uh, but I think that might be it. I feel like maybe the statics are stored in thread local storage or something like this. Maybe. Um, I don't know. To be honest, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Uh, but I have a feeling that it has something to do with the threading. Uh, I don't actually know. It might have nothing to do with the threading for all I know, uh, but we're going to find out. Okay, so that's all working uh, up to the point where we're getting multiple copies, but everything else about it seems to work okay. So the question is just, why are we getting multiple values, right? Why? Uh, so the first thing we could do is just turn off threading and see if that's actually the case as a test so that I know what I'm looking for, right? So I know whether I'm looking for something to do with the threading or whether it has nothing to do with the threading and it's just a regular old bug uh, that, doesn't have to, that doesn't have anything to do with that, right? So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna re reduce the number of threads down to a different number and see if that changes the number of duplicates uh, that we get, right? Uh, so when we have create thread here, uh, when we do this right, right here, and we have the sort of uh, thread count thing, uh, win32 make queue, I'm gonna just reduce that number, right? So temporarily, I'm gonna say that there's just one thread in these guys, and then I'm gonna run it. Uh, and let's see, see what we get. So that looks to me like we got less in the ground out in the ground chunks outlines, uh, but everybody else has way plenty, you know, actually has tons of them, right? Um, so I would say that does not look, that just does not look to me uh, like it is, it is a threading thing, right? Uh, that looks pretty much not like a threading thing to me. All right, so if we're not looking for a threading thing, then we have to just figure out how come we're adding these things multiple times right? Like what's happening there? Uh, and I'm not exactly sure because I feel like we shouldn't actually call that function at all uh, where we do the, that, uh, that initialization. I feel like that should not be getting called multiple times. What I want to do is I want to go inspect a call site now and see if I'm right about that or whether the compiler is doing something else in there uh, entirely. So let's just take a breakpoint here uh, and I'm going to go ahead and go to the disassembly because I just want to see what is actually happening uh, inside this disassembly, right? Uh, so here we go. We're coming through this at the first, you know, the very first time. Uh, we're, we're taking a look at this uh, S3 location, which I assume uh, is where the statics are stored. And we're taking a look to see whether we've initialized it or not. Uh, and it turns out that we have not, right? So this jump, this jump not equal, that jump would have jumped us past, right, 1266 right there. You can see it goes to 86H, right? 86H is down here somewhere. There it is. Uh, so it would just skip over this code and start doing other stuff uh, in the event where uh, it was not, uh, it, where it didn't need to initialize, right? Uh, so then we're going to load this stuff in here. Uh, here we go. And presumably, like, again, all this stuff, like where we're actually calling to debug initialize value, uh, that stuff is all happening only this one time, right? So that should never happen again, the recompute on exit change, uh, I don't think, right? Here it goes. Uh, we're putting that guy in there. Uh, we're, we're pushing him onto the debug stack. Uh, and that's just, that's just it, right? Um, nothing else happens here. It just initializes the value exactly like you would expect. So I don't see why that would have multiple. Let me check one that's actually that I can see is being. So and that one gets added multiple times, as well, right? 
So, yeah. Not only that, but it's the same debug ID, so it's like it just keeps looping over itself as well, right? So I don't understand. I think we've got a problem with our tree. I don't think we actually have a problem necessarily with our, I think we're, well, I don't know what we're doing. This is a bit of a puzzler. I'm not sure exactly what's happening. That's kind of bizarre. That's a little bizarre. Collate, add variable to group. Dlist insert, link. Event is the one to add. It does not have children. Uh, assert link event type is not equal to begin block. Okay, that seems pretty innocuous to me, right? That doesn't seem particularly weird. Uh, let's see what happens in our in our hacky printout thing here. So there's only, presumably we're just printing just this one tree, I assume, uh, and then we're kind of doing our, our traversal here. Uh, and again, that seems pretty sane to me. I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, so it could be because we are collating multiple times on the, re yeah. That's, I think, still, it's, I think it's all just the same thing now I think about it. It's all going to be because we're collating multiple times as well, right? When we do collate debug records, anytime we call restart collation, it's not going to wipe them. It's not going to go wipe those guys out. So you know, presumably, if when we did restart collation, we actually did a, a, a flush here of those guys, then we would be fine. But of course, we don't want to do that because we want them to stick around permanently, right? So that's a bit of a bummer. It's okay, I suppose, um, because uh, we could also make it so that when these things get added. Uh, we could make it so that they, if they find themselves in the hierarchical name, they don't add a new one. But I don't know. So I would say basically, I think what's happening there is when we restart collation, it'll just reread those events and add them again. And so I think really what we need to do uh, is just stop doing that entirely. Uh, you can see, like we do this uh, a couple times, right? When the exe is reloaded, uh, we do it uh, anytime refresh collation happens, right? Uh, which is anytime you press like the left mouse button as well. So I feel like that is really what the problem is. And when the frame, when the frame count, right, in here, we're doing it every frame. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That was the next thing we need to fix anyway. Uh, so I'm just gonna say that's it for today. Uh, tomorrow, that pretty much means that's what we have to fix, right? Uh, and that's good anyway because it's kind of been going on too long having that sort of weird janky like how do these events get retired sort of a thing. Uh, so I think probably what we would want to do is just legitimately go in there and be like, okay, let's actually clean this out and make it so that we process one frame at a time and that as things fall out of the buffer, we get rid of them and stuff like that, uh, which is going to be a little bit of work, uh, but we'll do it, right? Uh, so I think think that's all good and I think probably uh, yeah I mean we probably should make a pretty big dent in it tomorrow I don't know if we'll be able to finish it in time but we could probably make a pretty big dent in it tomorrow and then that would fix our problem with the multiple editions so I'm gonna go ahead and go to the Q&A Des Desu use says variable initiation hack in debug if macro makes my internal code quality kitten sad. Would it be possible to move that initiation to struct quote quote method? Uh, I 
I'm not sure what you mean. Disuse, could you be more specific? BTN Games, persisting the debug value between live code loading is great. I didn't understand what you were doing, but then I got it with the demo, really cool. I had conflated the value of a variable with the value of debug, value of debug of the variable, small addition for a huge benefit. Okay. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. Although I would like Des used to, to say what he thought was the thing he wanted to have be cleaner. Um, didn't really understand what he was saying. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, he's talking about this right here, uh, but I'm not sure. Beating games, are you sad you didn't fix collation? If no more questions come in, it would be neat to see it now, so you're not sad. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be a pretty involved thing, right? Like that's our final sort of thing for handling the flow of data through the system. So I'm not gonna fix it in like 10 minutes, right? Um, basically that's the thing where it just kind of actually parcels it up. Mr. Forza mentioned, will you have time tomorrow to look at four coder? I am trying to decide whether to prioritize getting the new demo out tomorrow morning. Um, I would say it depends on whether it's closer to being switchable to, to use for me, which I think, um, I think it was completion and make inside the program. I'm trying to remember what the main holdups were uh, for four coder. And I, I don't remember what they are, but I could look, uh, because like you added undo, which was awesome and is definitely something that would have prevented me from, uh, being able to switch permanently, but that's not something I need to do a four coder Friday on. Cause it's like, yes, awesome. That's checked off the list, but I don't need to test it. I trust that you have it working. Right. And that's undo. Um, so I'm trying to think if there are any other things I need to play with and it would depend, right? Um, it would depend if there's new features that would be in that demo that I uh, should, should see how, if I can move more of my uh, to-do list over to, then we could do it. Uh, if not, then I don't tend to add, I, I don't tend to really need to do a four coder Friday for things where it's like, this was a good feature addition, but it's not currently blocking my, my dot Emacs. I guess that's a really long and more winded, uh, way of doing it. Mr. Force mentioned, gotcha. I do have parameterized commands that I'd love to hear a response on. Uh, sure. Well, you know, don't forget, dude, you don't have to wait for the pre stream. You could just send me the demo, like it just send me an email and I'll reply. <laughs> 
Um, so I, what I would say is like, you know, if I have time, we could do a four coder Friday, but even if we don't, just send me an email and I'll, I'll look at it and send back a reply. The nighties fly. Why are you awesome? Okay, I just, I guess, you know, sometimes you just are awesome. Which dojo did you train to become a code warrior? Uh, I don't know, but like code warrior is a bad term because there used to be a program called code warrior uh, that was like actually kind of lame. It was a integrated development environment for the Mac. Uh, let's see here. Disused, elaborated with a C muratory prefix. Really? Because I don't see it, but that may be because the network is totally broken on my Linux laptop because Linux is amazing. So I haven't seen it, unfortunately. I'm looking at the raw stream and I don't, I don't see anything from disused. Mac the nobody, I quote, instead of writing debug event name equals initiator, another val something, blah, 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 make a struct constructor debug event that initializes the value. Wait, why? But why would I do that? What, what would be the point of doing that, though? Like, that doesn't actually do anything different, does it? And I guess I would say, I actually have a large number of problems with what you're, suggest what you're suggesting, because if I add a constructor to debug event, then I can no longer actually make one on the stack without it calling that constructor. And then I'd have to make another constructor that would make it so that it would use that one in preference of the other one. It, it, like, no, like that's, making a constructor for a debug event is definitely not on the table. Um, so that I definitely wouldn't do. But I also am not sure what problem you're trying to solve in the existing code. Just used so that you don't do assignment in the function call in the macro, which makes me really sad. But why does it make you sad? Like what, what makes you sad about that? The sequence of operations that the CPU needs to do are the same, right? So why do we care where they're, which part of the struct, the, which part of the line is causing them to occur, right? I mean, at least in this case, you can actually see what's happening. Whereas in your constructor example, you wouldn't even know what was happening. You have to go look at the constructor, right? So I would actually say that I, I actually vastly prefer the one as written here, even though it's kind of uh, atypical to making constructor, which I think is probably worse on all counts. It's less understandable by a person who is going to read it. Um, it's uh, more likely to create problems in other pieces of code because now there is a constructor in the struct, which it didn't have before. And so now the compiler will demand that you call that constructor unless you add a secondary constructor to avoid calling it when you're going to call it, right? Um, so, so yeah, I, I, would, I would actually strongly disagree with the with this suggestion that making a struct constructor for debug event is, is a better way of writing that code. I, I would say it's actually strictly worse. That said, I mean, you know, in your code base, you should do whatever you want. Uh, but in my code base, I would not make that choice.
Also, it really bothers me that the network on this laptop is so bad that I didn't see disused original post. Like, that's super... Oh, no, there it is. I did miss it. There it is right there. Okay. Whew. I was going to be really grumpy about that if it was, like, not passing me stuff. That would have been bad. Uh, and Elvin, I have not had any chance to play any games recently. In fact, the only time I've had the ability to play games, it was the games that I streamed the other, like, two weeks ago or whatever. That was the only time I've had to play games. I wish I had more time to play games, but at the moment, I, I just don't. So... Martin Cohen, yes, Elvin is Elxenoised. Uh, I kept trying to pronounce his name Elxenoised or whatever, uh, but then at some point, like, he just said, you can just say Elvin. That's what he said. Uh, so now I just say Elvin, which is a lot easier to say, to say the least. How did you keep up that awesome beat just now? Uh, it's just like, it's the rhythm, man. The Night is Fly. What games type of games? I like all kinds of games if they're interesting. I don't like games that are like kind of very the same to like something I've already played and just kind of like phoning it in. Like, I don't like it when they do like, we're gonna do a new licensed movie title. It's like, it's the Avengers game. And it's like the same game as like every other game, only like the little sprite that like you push the button to like punch or whatever is now the Hulk instead of like something else. Like those games just bore me so much. So I like games where there's something, like the game design is like interesting in some way. You know? So. Oh, it's El Zen, not El Ven. That would help, because then I never knew why there was an X in there. I'm like, why is there an X? El Zen is, is easy. El Zen is, we can just call it El Zen as well. All right. I'm going to wind it down here. I don't see any more programming cues. So I'm going to call it done. Let's save that amusing little diagram. All right. Uh, so that's it for today. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along with the code at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org, and it comes with the source code, uh, so you can go ahead and follow along at home. Uh, we also have a forum site. You can go if you want to post questions or look at our annotated episode guide. We have a Patreon page where you can support the video series. We have a tweet bot uh, that tweets the schedule at you. So if you want to catch the stream live, which, by the way, the last live stream for two weeks will be tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. After that, I am away for two weeks, so I cannot uh, stream to you, uh, but I will resume after that. So everyone has two weeks to catch up. I expect everyone to be caught up. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, that'll be some catch up. Uh, so yeah, that's it for now. Until then, uh, till tomorrow, have fun programming, and I will see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.